Hi there. Welcome to Cinema Shame, a podcast whose title has always been meant to be aimed at the people doing the talking and not at the films being talked about. But then sometimes there are episodes like today's where it's clearly referring to both. I'm Alan Mott, joined as always by James Patrick and our special guest, Chuck Dowling. Many of you might know Chuck from the years he spent co-hosting the Bad Movie Fiends podcast, or from his YouTube channel, Water Cooler Films, where you can find film reviews and random movie clips along with gaming and pinball-related content. When I asked Chuck what film he wanted to talk about this episode, I wasn't surprised by his answer as much as I was by the fact that he hadn't seen it already. Which leads me to my first question, Chuck. Why did it take cinema shame for you to finally sit down and watch Superman 4, The Quest for Peace? The greatest hope against the threat of nuclear war is Superman. I'm going to do what our governments have been unwilling or unable to do. Effective immediately, I'm going to rid our planet of all nuclear weapons. The greatest threat to Superman is Lex Luthor. Smarter than I thought. We can make the world safe for war profits. He's created the ultimate weapon to annihilate the Man of Steel. You'd risk worldwide nuclear war for your own personal financial gain. Nobody wants war. I just want to keep the threat alive. I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, I think it just became one of those things. It just became a... I didn't see it when it came out, and time marched on, and I heard a lot of bad things about it, obviously, and it it just became one of those things. It was just like, there's no easy way to just sit down and watch Superman 4. It it just, it, it... Well, I get it. It's hard to carve out time. It's like, tell your family and friends that you're busy, you're watching Superman 4. Everything has to get put on hold. That's not something you could admit to doing. Except I'm fully aware of the movies that Chuck watches on a regular basis. Which is why it makes Superman 4 even more egregious. Because <laughs> part of me was imagining like you pitching a Quest for Peace for a Bamfcast episode. And the other members just going, no, we've seen it. Fuck no, we are not doing that movie. Which I know has happened in the, with other movies where you guys have said, like, oh, we, we, we talked about doing this episode, but somebody vetoed it. I think the holdup there probably would have been me being super anal about it and being like, well, we probably all need to do the research and watch the first three. Yeah. <laughs> to really understand how this one stands out from the rest. And so that's probably what prevented us from doing it. Now, I will admit... About three, four years ago, I sat down to do this very thing and watch Superman 4, but I watched the first three movies, and then I watched Supergirl, and after that, I was like, I don't really want to watch any more of these, and <laughs> just it just it just faded away, and I forgot all about it, so... It's because Supergirl wasn't in Superman 4. I mean, that's really why you couldn't go on. Supergirl is the only one I've seen in a physical theater... And that was actually in 2014. Oh, my God. Okay. (laughs) And I did it in New York. (laughs) During my trip to New York, I went and saw Supergirl. (laughs) Uh, I was actually... Because it it came up for some reason. Someone I know on Twitter was talking about, like, certain movies uh, playing a lot on television. Like, who... So, like, even though they weren't very good, people saw them a lot. And it, it made me think of, like, we were recording this episode. And... It made me remember how when Superman, the movie, was on TV, it was like a two-day event. Whereas when I eventually saw Superman 4, it was airing uh, like after midnight on a local channel where it played every couple of months because it was, like, it was part of the, the package of movies they had bought. And that, and so I, I, I don't think I ever watched it from beginning to end that way. But I had basically seen the whole thing, just picking up bits and pieces over over the years. And it wasn't until I actually bought like the Blu-ray set that I sat down and watched it from beginning to end. Mostly just because it came with the commentary, and I wanted to like listen to the commentary because I figured there'd be some good tidbits in it, and there actually are. Like, it's one of those movies where the behind the scenes story is so much more fascinating than the movie that actually ended up being made. I figured 
when I was watching this last night that at some point I would go, oh, wait, no, I did watch this like on TV or something. But I legit, aside from the trailer, had not seen anything in that movie. So it was a revelation for me. (laughs) I'm going to spin you a story that's semi-related. Now, I had watched all the Superman movies. This is not in question. Why this relates to this story is that I had not watched Jaws 4. In part, in my mind, because I equated it with Superman 4, the legendarily bad fourth installments of these franchises, and I just watched Jaws 4 a couple years ago and really liked it. That's how this this how this story ends, is that the, your, the redemption story isn't on the side of the Superman situation. <laughs> Jaws 4 The Revenge, yes. Quest for Peace, no. Clark, are you okay? There are bad effects that are enjoyable, and then there are bad effects that are just bad effects. Problem was, is that Superman was literally the most expensive movie made up to its time. Like, in today's dollars, it was a $265 million movie, which, you know, there are a lot of movies now that have spent that much, but at that time, it was, like, they spent literally a million dollars just on the title credits, And so that's how you know what a drop-off Superman 4 is, is because the credits start, and it's the discount dollar bin version of those credits. So immediately, right from, like, literally the first second, you are going, oh my god, like, this is a serious drop-off from what we were used to. Well, okay, so I watched this on Max last night, and, and the transfer on Max is in 4K. Yeah. So... I'm looking at this movie when it starts, and also I noticed it's 90 minutes, and I thought, wow, finally, an efficient yeah. Superman movie. That'll be great. That turns out to not be a very good thing, which we will get to, but... Oh, you're so... wishing for that first run, run time, aren't you? <laughs> so, there's no canon logo at the beginning of it. That's... That's... Yeah. I figured... That was part of their deal kind of with Warner Brothers, Because yeah. the canon logo gets you pumped. It's like, yes, let's do this. And it's not yeah. there, so that's fine. Whatever, but... Well, it's because when you see the Warner Brothers logo, you're expecting <laughs> a, a real switch. movie. When you see the Canon's logo, you're <laughs> expecting a Canon movie, and they're two completely different fair. things. Yeah. <laughs> I do okay or what, Uncle Wax? Lenny, I've always considered you the Dutch elm disease in my family tree. But this time, nephew, you did fine. The look of the transfer of this movie elevates it in a slight way of like oh this is this is a movie like the other movies <laughs> it it fools you a little bit because you're like oh this looks okay <laughs> from it, like a film a moment, stock standpoint so I, I know exactly when that switch flips that you know you're not watching what you think you're watching and you're you're right it starts okay the the credits not not notwithstanding because they look like they don't want to be there either <laughs> You get to the space scene where he saves the, the the Russian cosmonaut and the ship that they're using the the effects it's a model and it's fine the, it looks like it like you'd expect and then as soon as the was it I don't remember what it hits him space junk or something like it hits him and starts spinning the spaceship and you change it's not just floating anymore the the actual effect of the spinning makes everything look like it came out of a cereal box suddenly. And that's when you know that you're in trouble. I feel like even more in that scene, it's when you see Superman fly away back to Earth. Because it's very much, it has very much the feel of like the Kirk Allen, like cereal, where it, like Superman was literally animated and all of the flying sequences. And it feels like, yeah. I mean, these are $6 million yeah, yeah, man yeah. effects we're dealing with. It does look like a few color streaks just kind of being shifted around in the background to move away. It's not very convincing. But, okay, so that effect of Superman that he's flying straight at the camera, and they do it with the bad guy in this too, man, that looks bad, and they use it a dozen times. Yeah. (laughs) The one thing that I had the giggles with, and I went back and watched it again, just totally... Not something that I would ever care about, but because I was in a mood today when I was rewatching it. When he's Superman is they're going on the joy flight and they're flying over that herd yeah. of cattle. Why? <laughs> well, I I remember even as a kid, like my my inner bitch coming out 
because I would be going like, why did they put her in that dress for that scene? Like, she looks good in it when she's, like, standing around. But as soon as they put her on this obvious platform to fake the flying scenes, it's like, that is the worst possible dress for her to be, for them to recreate the scene. Like, that thing that thing that annoys me the most about that scene is that it's, like, a 90-minute Superman movie and they spent five minutes recreating the best scene from the first movie for no reason because they basically have him like reveal himself like, oh, like I'm really, you know, Clark, I'm Clark Kent and Superman. And she's like, oh, I remember now. And then he kisses her, get her again and makes her forget. So the scene is completely superfluous, doesn't need to be in there. And you realize that they, because the original cut of this movie, like they cut 45 minutes from this movie after a bad test screening. And you're like, why did they leave this part in? Like they they cut out the cool like bizarro version of uh, of Nuclear Man, to, uh, and and kept that. <laughs> Clark, 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 things aren't that bad. Clark, stop! Clark, Clark, Clark. Clark! I okay. Yeah. Kept the cattle. I, yeah, I was slightly on board with this film up until that point, and yeah. then I was like, "Wait, we're doing this again?" Yeah. And then it was like, "Wait, we're undoing <laughs> this again? This is this is a crime against Lois Lane. Yeah. What you're doing here, Superman? This is, you can't keep doing this." And the fact that he does it to get her to have a conversation with him about what he should do, and she basically just says. You're Superman. You know what to do. It's like, oh my god, Th- this literally had no point whatsoever. Why is this still here? And that goes back to the stuff at the beginning too, because the 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 satellite rescue doesn't have anything to do with anything. It's just, hey, Superman did a thing, and that's fine. You should show Superman doing stuff. But then you have the scene where he goes to Smallville because I guess Martha has died, yeah. and they they don't even mention that. But he's selling the farm. His spaceship is still underneath the floorboards of the barn, which seems bad to just leave that there. There's another crystal inside of it, the just plot device crystal that he needs for later in the film. And then a realtor shows up and they just hang out for like five minutes. I'm like, why is this scene here? Because later in the film, especially when you're like, oh my God, there is so much stuff they obviously cut out of this. Why is he talking to that dude for five minutes? We don't even know if he ever sold the farm. And I think the thing that immediately bothered me about that scene is that one thing that I really differ from with like popular opinion about the portrayal of Superman is that to me, it's much more interesting to pursue the idea that Clark Kent is actually who Superman is. And when he's Superman, he's pretending to be Superman because that's what people expect. Whereas like people like wanted to be like Batman where like, you know, you know, he's really, he's really Superman all the time, but Clark, he's just pretending to be Clark Kent to fool everybody. Like to me, that's the most boring possible interpretation. But I feel like in the, like the first, you know, two or three movies, they really sort of do it closer to what, like how I, how I think it should be. Whereas in this one, you really, the scene, all of the scenes with Clark, it really feels like he's playing it up to trick them. Like, it's like, oh, I can't hit a baseball. Like, dude, you, you can hit the baseball. Just don't like hit it out of the stratosphere, you know, <laughs> like bunt it. Like <laughs> It's all or nothing, man. You can't, yeah. you can't go half Superman. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's the line too. You never could hit a curveball, curve And then he just laughs hysterically. But yeah, this is and in the scene, you know, it's adding nothing. Yeah. Like th- there's a part of you that knows this is this is a pointless fiasco. Well, it, it, in the commentary, the screenwriter talks about like how basically they thought the best scenes in the first movie were the Smallville scenes. So they wanted to like bring that back. But it was like, well, you well, you didn't in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not even Smallville. It's yeah clearly not the same <laughs> yeah and, and, and the thing is like in the wikipedia it actually goes so far to say that the original set or the original house that they filmed in in alberta still existed at the time they were just too cheap to go there <laughs> so it's like some place they set up in england to to shoot another example of like sort of this movie like just making in, in, like bizarre choices to me uh 
is the scene in the subway, which was supposed to be a lot longer. Like it's it's one of those ones where you can obviously tell how they basically cut it to the bone for like because the special effects were so bad. But on the on the on like sort of the walls of the subway, you see these ads for New York. And like you could forgive that if like, oh, they meant to like they're shooting Metro- New York for Metropolis and were too cheap to, you know, change the the things. But no, like the the screenery, he couldn't remember, like they were either shot in London or Montreal. And I'm like, well, then that means that was a choice to put up a New York based thing. Like you could have just as easily created a Metropolis like a uh, a billboard and put that up there but like no that would have cost an extra ten dollars for our production department the prop department had some issues in this film like putting the extra U's in headlines and yeah <laughs> so there's a th- okay so clark has an apartment that we see which is a, it seems odd it's it's really weird to have several scenes of clark just hanging out in an apartment not doing anything yeah. i'm sure there are yeah. lots of things happening in the world but clark is just hanging out so yeah there's there's a he point is, he is sick in at least one scene <laughs> yeah that's true that's fair but in the background at one point there is a tampa bay buccaneers pennant and i that had to be like just the only american thing that existed within a 20 mile radius where they were shooting <laughs> And they were just like, get something for color back there. And I was like, there is literally no way. <laughs> That's yeah. Dude's Superman. just a fan of Vinny Testaverde. I don't know what more explanation you need. <laughs> oh, wait. Hold, they, hold on. They called Vinny Testaverde Superman. Did they? they? I, I, I don't remember I that. Think but... they, I think they did. And now suddenly this makes sense. If that's makes sense. true, this movie just got a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> it has one in joke that only sports nerds will actually get. <laughs> I might be completely making that up, but I so, when you said his name, I was like, oh wait, no, that okay, maybe I don't know, but still, the thing about okay, so there, this is one of the things that bugs me in movies all the time is when they try to make it look like America. Yeah, this movie looks so much not even like England. I, it's, it's. Every time they are somewhere, you're just looking at it going, where is this? Like, this doesn't look like our universe at all. Like, when they are outside the Daily Planet, and it is clearly just a field, and they've had to go and get a bunch of hooligans to stand around to make it look like New Yorkers, and they're all pretending to look up when you know there's nothing higher than two stories in front of them. Yeah. It is hurts like the 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 look of where they are at all times hurts it hurts me to do to look at that apparently i i haven't read but apparently i I read a passage from uh christopher reeve's uh, autobiography and he specifically talks about like the scene uh at the united nations where they actually begged them to let them like go to the actual United Nations to shoot because no other building looks like the United Nations. And like, no, like we're just going to shoot this in this industrial park in England and get like, you know, a hundred extras. Cause like he actually writes about like how, like if Richard Donner was directing the sequence, it would be epic and it would be this moment like that really matters and means something. But in this movie, they just, because like the elephant in the room of this movie is that they literally cut the budget in half just when they started. So they basically had to fire all of the uh, the original sort of people who worked on the first three movies because they were like, we're not taking a cut and pay, you know, to work on these films. Uh, and so that's why the but like like the special effects are that shitty is because they basically that's 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 the most that Canon was willing to to pay for, which. It's kind of because compared like compared to some of the other other films that had similar budgets like um, uh, uh, what's the Tobey Hooper uh, space vampire Life Force. one uh, Life Force and uh, Masters of the Universe those films like cost the same amount as Superman four and they look pretty good like they actually you know look like big budget movies from the time so I think I think that is like a case where like partly if if they had if they had probably had more time to prepare with that budget they might have been able to make up for some shit but because it was basically forced at them at the last minute that's why i think it just looks so terrible from each frame on and also talking about margot kidder like like i feel like she is really done dirty with this movie because they were like well 
she's not really that hot anymore. So we're going to cast Mariel Hemingway and have her be attracted to uh, Clark Kent. So that way we can have this sort of screwball comedy, like, uh, like what, what I guess it'd be a square because you got Clark Kent, Superman, uh, Lois Lane, and uh, Mary Hemingway's character. <laughs> and so, like, to me, like, you, you talk about this movie being only 90 minutes. Like, the, the sequence that makes sense if this is, like, a two-hour, ten-minute movie is the one where he has to do the, like, the sitcom, like... Like, be, like, go on, go, go on two dates at the same time thing. But in the context of the movie, this short, it's like, why are we spending this much time on this? <laughs> well, thinking that that's why the audience is there to watch yeah. this romantic square happen uh, is odd. But also, okay, as as terrible as that sequence is in especially in terms of like what are you doing like the movie is in yeah. progress what are you doing yeah. um i will say i was not enjoying the scene and i was angry by it however the two or three weird texas switch things they do yeah yeah where obviously a dude in a suit runs behind something in the background and then christopher reeve dressed as superman runs out the other side yeah is fun they're they're yeah. fun dumb low budget things but I hate the scene. <laughs> as much as I think she shouldn't be in the movie, I actually think Mariel Hemingway might be my favorite thing in the movie. Just because I just I'm always I'm always gonna cheer for, you know, really hot women who actually are good at comedy, which I think she was. So <laughs> She does she does the most with what she's given. Yeah. Uh yeah. Margot Kidder wasn't given anything, so it's hard. Yeah. It's hard to base. I mean, <sighs> she she's given more than she was given in Superman three, where they like completely wrote her out of the movie and she's in it for one scene. <laughs> but here she's yeah. she's really replaying the same thing that the, she's already done. The character is given nothing yeah. more to do besides greatest hits. Yeah, which was really why she wasn't in three was because well that was that was a salary dispute. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She wanted more money. They wouldn't pay her, so they were like, "Oh, we're gonna write you out, and uh, we'll we'll give uh, we'll give like the Pamela Stevenson a, a, a role as the sexy vixen." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, 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 honest to God, felt bad for Mario Hemingway a little bit at two points, like one where she calls Clark into her office and she's like, yeah. "How will I sit for him?" Yeah, yeah, and yeah. she yeah. just sprawls out on the desk like what are you even doing like- it, it, it's funny because in the commentary the screenwriter goes basically goes that's not how he wrote this scene that was something the director did like like we we tried to write it more like screwball comedy where like the sexiness is there but it's not like oh i'm i'm gonna be really hot right now like it's yeah yeah let so me just think- sit on the editor's <laughs> desk and here are my legs it's yeah. like which, Ma'am. in fairness, like that's probably the best special effect in the movie. Are is Mariel Hemingway's legs? I mean, <laughs> pretty special. She has one line of dialogue that she just kind of throws out there, and I felt so bad when she said it. Which was, "How can one man be so square and so delicious?" Yeah, <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh wow, that's." <laughs> I will give like that's one thing I like I. I wish other movie, other like Superman adaptations have done this. It's like, I think she's the only character who's actually liked Clark Kent for Clark Kent and not because he's friends with Superman. Like it's, yeah. it's purely a thing where like she actually thinks he's hot as he is. So I think that just like, you know, as much as, you know, I disliked her, like I, as much as I felt like she was unnecessary in the movie, I did like the fact that like, oh, they tried something there. Like, but of course I think that's just for the square. That's not because they thought like, oh, we're doing something new and interesting here by having a character actually just, you know, be into Clark. Yeah, no, they had 20 minutes of bits they had to get to. So they <laughs> needed they obviously needed a new person to be put in danger and that said, if we're talking most egregious characters, we have to have the sop to the young people, which is uh John Cryer's uh Lenny Luther, the uh nephew of uh of Lex, uh who is uh, a, a a serious uh if, if we're if we're t- like I'm not even going to go with like Ned Beatty as Otis. To me, like I think Valerie Perrine as Miss Tessmacher. I, I feel like like going with John Cryer was just a serious crime against uh, cinema. <laughs> It 
it's hard to rationalize, really. Like he's committed to the bit. Yeah, <laughs> I guess that's just like yeah. we need. It's it, it's like who can you put in the movie? Like, if is it a stunt casting bit? Because John Carr had a name at this point. It was, yeah, it was. It was one hundred percent. They thought they they needed a young person in the movie to get the teens interested, and he was just coming off pretty and pink. So that 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 was why they they did it. Yeah, good for him. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> well, and honestly, it did it did lead to a good thing because he ended up playing Lex Luthor in Supergirl, and I would legitimately say he's one of the best Lex Luthers uh, in, in in like live action. I think so. Like it, it did it did end up having a happy ending for you know for him in, in the end, but <laughs> in the moment, like it was what it and Morgan Stewart coming home really put a wrench in his his career until he was able to resurrect it with the tv show yeah I, he's mostly embarrassing himself here he but he had one thing that inadvertently made me laugh is when superman decides to just spin him around in place and yeah. they've adr'd a line in where he yeah. just goes oh no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that's also like talking about the bad effects it's like they obviously like he's on a wire spinning around but they've also sped up the footage but yeah. they've like placed electronics behind them in the scene so you can see the electronics sped up at the same time like it's sort of dudes if you're speeding shit up then you don't put anything behind him that is going yeah. to give the trick away <laughs> And also you have Gene Hackman coming back to create Nuclear Man. And Nuclear Man is uh, an example of one of my least favorite things in comic book movies is when you have a hero who has a vast array of supervillains to choose from and they decide to make a new one to fit like the story they came up with. You are nothing. I am the father now. You have my voice. No. You have my voice. Basically, what happened with the the story of Superman 4 was that Christopher Reeve was very reluctant to come back. But then he had this idea of, well, what if we make this, give this movie a serious message? What if we make it about nuclear disarmament? And so the screenwriters go, he actually, he had a part in the story. Uh, He has a story credit. And like, so we'll make the villain Nuclear Man. That way it's literally Superman fighting against nuclear war. Uh, And uh, it's a case of them just being slightly too literal. I think they're like, they could, there was a, what's the, uh, is it Metalo or something? Like there's actually like a a Superman villain in the comics who's basically a cyborg with a, a kryptonite heart. I feel like with a little work, they could have adapted him and actually made him the villain instead of creating this this character who who actually we 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 only see half of Nuclear Man's story because in the original cut of the film there were two Nuclear Men, uh, and and the first one was this sort of misshapen mistake who was basically Bizarro, but they 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 cut those scenes and so we only get the the handsome Arnold Schwarzenegger version. Uh, of him who's played by an actor named Mark Pillow who only has four credits and he he's not heard in the movie because he's voiced by Gene Hackman uh, at which it's one of those things that doesn't make make sense but yeah I I was personally like if you're going to make a Superman 4 and you're getting Gene Hackman back then do sort of like a you know Batman Returns sort of thing where you like have them hook up with another like unused Superman villain because I feel like the the Superman vo- rogue gallery was super super underused used by all of the Salkine movies basically luther well they never really dug into any of it at all it, there was no inclination to do so they had their villain and, they, and damn sure gonna use him again and again and this you, you could have even gone back i mean this they took pieces from legitimate superman comic villains and used them in this story but they didn't use any of the villains that were actually tangentially related to their theme which seems wildly strange to to bother coming up with new ideas when it was already written for you yeah i mean i was just i did a quick glance through the the characters and the all comics i mean adam man was right there how much of a stretch is it to just nudge him a little bit into this story and, and maybe change some of his his characteristics to fit your needs the the this need to rewrite and and 
I mean, you're coming in with a limited budget. You know this. You're coming in with... Well, they didn't know it. When they were writing the screenplay, they didn't know it. You're writing a movie for canon films. You're restricted. <laughs> People forget that this was the canon films that was doing, like, Rambo 3. <laughs> like, they were... like they And, and over the top. Like, they were... <laughs> like, they were infamous for spending a lot of money on movies even well they were at this point they were also stretched so thin that they couldn't distribute their own films and they had to come to warner brothers to bail them out and actually finish this movie well it's it's because their whole like like their business model was we'll make a movie for one million to two million dollars and sell it to tv and the other sort of territories for five to six million dollars and so that works when you're making American Ninja. It doesn't work when you're making Masters of the Universe and Over the Top and like all of these movies. Like once you start paying uh, Sylvester Stallone twenty million dollars to be in your movie, then your business model is suddenly changes because their previous movies before that, like anything it made at the box office, was just gravy. By the time by the time it hit theaters, they'd already made a profit on that movie. But once they decided they wanted to become big shots, that's when, like, then actually grosses matter. And it turns out their taste level was pretty shitty. And they just started, like, making a bunch of really bad movies that, you know, were some of the most infamous flops of that era. I mean, I know I know how Golden Globus did business. And um, for those of you who don't know, they would bring a title yeah. and a genre Two can a poster, sometimes a poster. Yeah, sometimes a poster because those unmade posters are infamous. But so they'd bring an idea and a genre, and they'd sell it at can to investors. So I was really surprised to find out that this happened the exact same way. Yeah, they're at can. They Saul kind agrees to sell them Superman for five million dollars. In June of 1985, and like we're in the Superman business. <laughs> Why? Why is that how you're still doing business? <laughs> well, and, and basically, like we can blame Superman uh, for existing because Supergirl flopped. Because like their their plan was after Super, like their basically thought was if Superman three makes at least forty million dollars, we'll make Superman five or, or Superman four. But then Superman 3 actually did really well. It actually made $80 million. And they were like, okay, but before we make Superman 4, we'll make Supergirl and we'll create this whole like franchise that branches out. And then Christopher Reeve was like, yeah, no, I'm not going to have anything to do with Supergirl. And that changed a bunch of stuff that made them rewrite the script. And so then you have like Superman, Supergirl, which I actually have a lot of affection for. I mean, I, I pre it's one of those movies where I appreciate it's bad, but still I, I'm willing to forgive its crimes just because, you know, I like that it exists and I like Faye Dunaway and, you know, it's, it, it, it's just something I am not going to, you know, ever give up on. Whereas Superman four is a movie I'm happy to never watch again after having, after doing this, like, <laughs> Hello. Hello, she says. Well, hello to you, honey bun. Hello. I was wondering if you could tell me where I am. Well, they call this place Eddie. Lover's Lane, isn't it? You got it in one, Billy boy. Lover's Lane. Oh, no. You see, what I meant was, is, well, those lights over there, what are they called? Check out the view from back here, Eduardo. Oh. Stop hey. that. And especially, like, the thought that Wes Craven was going to direct this movie until he butted heads with uh, with uh, Christopher Reeve, and so this was going to be like like this could have been Swamp Thing. This could have been uh, which is uh, which is famous because that's another case of a movie that had its budget cut halfway through production, which is why the the suit, Swamp Thing suit suit looks as bad as it does in the first movie is because they basically like just literally just before they were about to start. Produ like actual like filming they were like oh yeah no you actually have half the money that we we promised so <laughs> it's probably for the best that Wes Craven because Sidney Fury probably did as well as he could with half the budget whereas I think Wes Craven would have somehow even made it look cheaper well okay let me let me let me just say something about the overall direction and look of this film I feel like a bunch of people went into this 
obviously thinking they had a certain budget. Obviously, it was yanked out from under them at the last minute. But I feel like people are trying. And I I always appreciate a movie if if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But if you can see that, oh, man, they are doing the best they can with what they've got. I, I can appreciate that. And I have to give Superman for a little bit of credit for that because everyone is still like, come on, we got to make the best thing we can make. Um, I will give a shout out to the people who made the miniatures in this movie. Some of them look really good. You know, they're miniatures like the fortress of solitude. You're like, okay, that's a really tiny thing. The volcano stuff is kind of silly looking, but still like the lava flow and stuff. It's all like, Okay, you did the best you could with what you've got. Well, that goes back to talking about the satellite too in the original. Like this in the in the opening scene, the satellites the look good. It's only when they add extra effects that that it, it turns yes. to to terrible. Yeah, every time you see an optical, it's not going to turn out well. Mm-hmm. But I mean, they did have problems like when like okay, none, nothing in the Great Wall of China sequence looks good at all. That's yeah. that's all very bad. Uh so so that didn't work. And then reading things were like, well, they couldn't get this effect, so they just reversed a shot of him waving at people. And I'm like, oh, wow. That's, I mean, still, you know, you're sitting there trying to do what you can. And it's not like they set out to make a 90-minute movie. They were told at the last minute, cut 45 minutes out of this. So I, it, it's hard. It's hard. I mean, when Canon's right there, you can blame Canon. It's, that's very easy. Like, everyone else was just like, man, I got to feed my kids. I got to... I got to do these things. I got to pay bills. More power to those people. But it's just canon was just so coked out and crazy at that time that it was just like, okay, guys, just, yeah, you blew this one. The one bit of trivia I picked up that I found fascinating was like as because it was canon, like they were planning the sequel while they were filming the movie. And apparently Superman 5, if it had been made, would have been made by Albert Pion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't have liked that. Uh... <laughs> but I want to see that movie. Sure. I want to know what. <laughs> I want to know what happens in that. Yeah, talk about the master of like basically taking like five cents and turning it into five cents. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I speak for all of us when I say that we'll do our best to cooperate. Thank you. Um, but a reporter's first allegiance has to be to the truth. The people of this city depend on us, and we can't let them down. I'm I'm a big defender of the Richard Lester cut of Superman Two. Uh, there's a lot, like a lot of the stuff that people complain about that in that movie. To me, is actually very faithful to sort of the the Silver Age of Superman, where basically, you know, what 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 were Superman's superpowers? Any power that the writer needed in order to get the plot finished. So like him like ripping off the crest and, and it becoming like this like like to me that is like a hundred percent out of the silver age and people hate it because it's a, like oh this is how silly comics are it's like yeah it's wonderful <laughs> that's how silly comics are I never I never had a problem with that either I, I think that I think that is so goofy and just you look at it and go whoa <laughs> <laughs> but but then you have this movie where I. I, as someone who is very forgiving and actually love that stuff, at a certain point, it just it it doesn't be feel silly anymore. It's just like, oh, they think we're that fucking stupid, <laughs> like like when Nuclear Man grabs Mariel Hemingway and flies her into space <sighs> where she's completely fine. Like guys, that that sequence didn't need her. And if it did need her, didn't have to take place in space where she would be dead instantly. <laughs> okay. I thought about all of that today because I kept coming back to it. And, and first of all, it is so strange how he just glances down at a newspaper and is like, lady. And then that becomes the crux of the rest of the film. It's yep. like, what? How did this happen? Um, I want to say maybe this is canon. Maybe this is something I made up, but I want to say that if you are in the proximity, if you are being touched by Superman, or in this case, the other guy who is basically yeah. Superman, Superman's whatever extends around you, like <laughs> like oxygen protection, yeah. gravity protection, whatever. So I was watching that scene. I'm like, wait, this doesn't make sense. But she never lets go of him. 
And I yeah. think that's how, from maybe a comic standpoint, you can explain that. It's still super dumb. I don't understand yeah. why he was like, come to space with me, but... <laughs> that that does explain why Lois doesn't freeze to death when they're flying like over like snow-capped mountains and she's just wearing like her cocktail dress. Like, right. Like, it's already, you know, freezing cold in the atmosphere and you're yeah. flying through like an Arctic place, like... She would not be comfortable in that situation. Yeah. Well, I mean, they do the whole thing where, like, it's they're just barely hanging on by their fingertips, and she's yeah, yeah. fine, but they lose contact, and then she drops. So yeah. <laughs> I'm going with that. That's my head cannon. so. <laughs> somehow, somehow something pulled me here. I always know when Superman's in trouble. <laughs> super, super, Superman, something's happened to him? Well, everybody's saying that he's dead, but... It can't be true. I just know it. I feel it in my heart. I I think he just needs help. Well, you know, wherever he is, Lois, I'm sure he'll manage. Oh, I just want to say, I want to say the, the point that this movie broke me to where I was like, nope, you're right, this sucks. Um, <laughs> which was, I they start doing the thing with the Statue of Liberty. And... Where he just <laughs> cleanly picks it up off the base and just chucks it into an intersection in downtown Manhattan. And I was looking at that, and it took my brain a minute to really go, wait, hold up, this is dumb. <laughs> like, this is yeah. really stupid. Like, this is unbelievably stupid. Like, people are out on the street just watching this. I mean, I realize the late 80s were a tough time for the Statue of Liberty. It was coming to life and walking down the street all the time. But... People are just standing outside just watching the Statue of Liberty fly over and then just plummet towards them. It is one of the goofiest things, like, conceptually I've ever seen. Well, and it, and it says something about, like, talking about, like, sort of the billboards and the confusion. It's like, I, I couldn't tell if they were, if this was happening in actual New York or if they're just going, like, Metropolis is New York, so the Statue of Liberty would be in Metropolis. Like... <laughs> I mean, yes, because all the stock footage has the Twin Towers in it. It's They are yeah. not trying to hide it in any way. But, yeah, it was just so... It, it, I think what bugged me the most was just how cleanly it came apart from the base. Yeah. It was like this this tourist, you know, trinket. It turns out the pick. whole time a strong wind could have knocked her over. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I was watching that. I was like, boy, this is real dumb. And then, like... It's at that point where he Superman gets scratched and his cape falls off. And I'm like, why did his cape fall off? What's happening here? What is going on? And then they cut to like, oh, it's a week later. Superman's dead. <laughs> yeah. I do like that in the commentary where Mark Rosenthal, who actually, uh, to his credit, wrote one of my uh, favorite 80 movies of all time, which is The Legend of Billie Jean. So he, he does have some cred in, in my heart. I literally just bought a, a vintage copy of uh, of that poster for $125 today. So that is the level of fandom I, I have for, for, for that film. But he was mentioning, like, like he, he is happy to point out, like, all the stupid stuff that just doesn't make sense. Like, even, like, like when they show, like, how, like, Nuclear Man is created by, by Luther cloning Superman. And he clones him using a hair that he gets from the Superman Museum. And we see how strong the hair is because it's holding up a 1,000-pound ball. And and then we see Luther basically just get the hair by using just ordinary, like, uh, bolt cutters to, like, this thing, like this hair is supposedly so strong that it can literally hold up a 1,000-pound ball. But you just, you know, a pair of, like, bolt cutters that you can get at any, like, hardware store, well, you, you can cut it just as easily. By that point in the movie, I thought he was just going to untie the knot. Like, I just... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what... The, speaking of that, like, the creation of Nuclear nuclear Man, the thing that I think is maybe the, the movie's biggest misopportunity is to have a sequence of trials and errors with him trying to create his own Superman and failing which the original version of the movie had which right which but like i want that overdone like that's that's like that creative spark here that could have made this silliness worthwhile in that we had different iterations it's sort of like the multiplicity theory like the copies of a copy art sort of as as bright as the original so he had to figure out how to perfect that but having like various versions of inept 
radioactive supermen that you know have to be dispatched in some way you know even like referencing gremlins too when you have the dim like idiot gremlins that that pop up like that could have even in something that's as poorly put together as this could have been something worth watching and to know that we dispensed with the only idea that felt original to this story is sort of maddening. I feel like if you were to take anything out of this movie and put it into another Superman movie, it is the idea of like, why is it the most powerful man in the world doing something to stop basically, you know, nuclear destruction? Like, I feel like that is like a story that could have actually been done really well. Because it is a philosophical question. Because in the like in the first couple of movies, they try to explain it off like as a Kryptonian, you must not you know get involved with man. Sort of like, well, no, obviously he's involved. Like when you're rescuing people all the time, you're making a difference. You're involved because for all you know, that kid you rescued is going to be the future president of the United States. Like, like so this I, it always struck me as false to be like, oh no, you can't get involved with the human beings. So the fact that this movie tackles this idea and it was really the reason why christopher reeve did it and so the fact that they and apparently a lot of the cut scenes involved the kid like apparently there was a scene where he goes to the school and basically tells the kid no to his face and so that like that because they cut all of that out you basically have like superman told me no and it's like well when when did he tell you no like <laughs> yeah, when that that whole segment was put together so poorly uh that the cuts that they made made it made me basically nonsensical. Yeah. Like the the transition to like the press, the kid giving the press conference, like this that came out of nowhere. Well, I mean, so the context you gave makes it make sense because the way the scenes play out is just them writing a tabloid headline. You know, Superman to kid yeah. drop dead. You know, it's like yeah, it's like oh okay. But I I honest to God think that the the plot of Superman deciding that he's going to rid the planet of nukes is a fascinating idea for a superhero movie that after that doesn't have much superhero stuff in it. Because yeah. the fascinating part of that should be, okay, so how are the two superpowers going to react to that? Yeah. And the only really thing that we see as the reaction is they just decide, test every missile we've got. Fire yeah. everything. <laughs> Yeah. Because as soon as he goes to the UN yeah. and says, I'm getting rid of all the nukes, they're like, well, fire that one from the submarine and fire that one from over here. And he's just scooping yeah. them all up in a big net and hammer throws them yeah. into the sun. And it's that's it, really. That's that's there's no like there's no conversations with like generals and presidents and, and premiers and yeah. all these things. No one is going like it's just everyone agrees. Yeah, everyone agrees instantly. Like, yeah, just take like, away our Superman nukes. wants to do it, we should do it. <laughs> so it's it's hilarious to me that at the end of this, when he's just like, You you just gotta live with it. Price of freedom, I guess, you know. It's just yeah. <laughs> you might die tomorrow, kid. you you and your whole family might burn. Smell you later. I'm Superman. And everyone's like, Yay! And I'm like, Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> the conclusion is that there's nothing I can do and just enjoy existential dread for every minute of your life. Bye. Yeah. I'll save you if you fall off a train, though. Hey, <laughs> it's the I 80s. Like, all the, like, silly, like, stuff, like, like, bullshit stuff in this movie, probably the most fantastical, is the scene in the U.N., where the 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 head of the UN basically go tells him, well, you don't you don't represent a country, so you have to represent a country. Is there a country willing to represent you? And like every single representative put their hands up. It's like I am sorry. Like half these people would be like, fuck you, Superman. You represent American imperialism, and like like there is no way that he would be universally supported like that. <laughs> Madam Secretary, I don't represent any country, but I'd like to address the delegates. Well, in that case, you will need a sponsor. I believe that will do. Please. Don't even get me started about all the flag stuff on the moon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean... Or, or, or even, like, literally, like, Superman, have you never heard of Pink Floyd? 
Like if if, you, if your villain is a it, it, it loses his yeah. powers when he's outside of sunlight, then don't put him just in a general spot on the moon. Put him on the dark side of the moon where there is literally never sunlight. We had to remove the moon from its spot in orbit in order to create <laughs> darkness on Earth. At least when Bruce Almighty did that. They acknowledged the fact that it would cause all sorts of fucked up problems with the tides and everything. Like yeah. in this movie, it's like, sure, you can just move the moon out of orbit. It won't affect anything. So what we've come to the conclusion of is that Bruce Almighty yeah. is more realistic yeah. <laughs> than Superman 4. Yeah, I, I made a note. I was like, uh, moving the moon is going to cause some problems, you guys. <laughs> yeah. And why wasn't he... So he was in the elevator... On the moon. But how was he get... How did he have powers in the elevator? There was a slit in the elevator that allowed just as much... Just enough sunlight to reactivate his powers. Why? Yeah. <laughs> because the plot demanded yeah. it. <laughs> and he dropped the elevator on the moon. He dropped it. <laughs> and it fell. Yeah. There, there is a consistent thing in all of Christopher... Christopher Reeve's performances of Superman, where he does something to a bad guy and is immediately like, that's it, I won this battle, and turns around and yeah. then is like, wait, yeah. what? And it's like, my dude, how have you not learned this lesson by now? Your your yeah. plan right now was the worst of all your plans to whip an elevator to the moon in the sunny part <laughs> and be like, well, that's that solved all our problems. Is like, I don't think it did. <laughs> <laughs> Although I will like I I actually would have given the film credit if like his whole plan was just to get nuclear man in the elevator and then like put it in a place where like it legitimately wasn't going to get any the bottom sun. of the ocean like it's this it's <laughs> yeah yeah there yeah. were options to be clear yeah. there were a few other options than just dropping it <laughs> and letting the moon's gravity <laughs> yeah take care of I, business. I, I legitimately, like, when I thought that was how it was going to end, I actually liked that, like, oh, I like that it's just, like, basically that simple. Like, he just did this one thing, and it was done, and it's over, and, you know, Lex Luthor's bullshit plan was over. But no, we have to have the final battle, so he has to have this stupid thing where he gets his powers back. But also, like, it is, like, the total, like, screenwriter cheat to have, like, Nuclear Man's power because Nuclear Man technically has the same weakness that Superman should have, because Superman gets all of his powers from the sun. So, it, like, why why does Superman like why is Superman able to like you know operate in darkness if the sun is the source of his powers? Uh, so it's like I I don't know why why He's that got works a battery that it way. stores up and then yeah yeah. <laughs> Well, going back to my or my concept that there were multiple failed attempts to create this nuclear man nemesis, this feels like it could like throwing me in the elevator, dispatching me on the dark side of the moon. If we're following through on the actual part of the plan, that would have made sense. This feels like a good way to eliminate maybe the third nuclear man, and we're still waiting for that big ending. We didn't need to do the oh, I you know. Oops, he got out of the elevator. It's, uh, somehow, some way, my, my plan failed. But, but it would have been an interesting way to dispatch one of them so we still had the surprise. Oh, there's still another one that Lex Luthor has conjured that's even better than this one. And that, you know, in, in the realm of rewriting Superman 4, this is, this is what I'm sticking with. The reason why I like your idea is because you could also have the added element that to do this, Luthor has to keep... St- Dealing like samples of Superman's DNA, <laughs> different different pieces of Superman. Different, different so it's like the hair didn't work handling. out. So so now now we have to get his toenails. So it's like heist and movie and like, too, yeah. and then yeah. we can actually use this yeah. John Cryer. I, 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 you could cut out the entire romantic subplot out of this movie and just have it be like this ca- heist caper yeah. where they're trying to get all the Superman DNA all the time. Like, well, that would be Mariel yeah. Hemingway's yeah. role too, is that she's in on it and she's able to she get gets, close she enough. She gets the, well, the to ultimate get, you know, Superman saliva DNA samples. Sample. Cause then we're, then we're going into Superman returns. Right. Territory. This is, <laughs> well, yeah, now there's all yeah. kinds of Superman samples. Cause yeah. <laughs> oh, um, Hmm. 
What's isn't there a, like there's a famous short story I can't remember who wrote it, but it's like basically like Man of Steel, Woman of Tissue, where it basically talks about how like if Superman was as strong as he was, he probably would like his ejaculation would probably kill a woman. I think that's like a schoolyard debate that has happened for for decades. <laughs> no, but I think it is an actual it is an actual <laughs> short story. Like it is something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I, cause I, I honestly, that was the first thing I, I thought of with the big twist in Superman Returns was like, oh, so he was able to do it and not kill her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, Spoilers for Superman Returns. Yeah, by sorry. The way. Yeah. The, the kid is his. <laughs> so, so he gets, okay, so he gets scratched by this dude's coke nails. Now, there's a shot. So, okay, we've established that this dude, Nuclear Man, is uh, just a glam rocker guy. Kind of wants to be Dolph Lundgren from Masters of the Universe, but isn't. He, he, he's basically, if, if you know uh, uh, Rock and Roll Nightmare, he's yes, basically exactly. Four. He's he's ba- he's not as built as that guy, but he's basically got that look. Yeah. So, part of his look is that he has monster nails. And at one point, he's fighting Superman in space, and there's a shot of the monster nails getting slightly longer, and the movie treats it like, oh, shit, now it's on. And it's like, so? Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> now now, now, he, now he's like an inch closer yes, exactly. to killing it's Superman. the proximity thing. He's like, now I can scratch you, which he does. Scratches his neck and gives Superman the flu, so... Clark just hangs, hides in his apartment all day. Well, <laughs> a, a flu that almost makes him. Bald. Well, see, that's like that is yeah. like he starts losing that's his hair. That's what's weird is that they treat it like it's just this flu, and then for a while he's not in the movie, and then they come back to him, and he, like his hair is gone, and what's left is gray, and he's all gaunt and and pale, and just struggling to get out to where his jacket is because that's where he kept the crystal. <laughs> And it's like, yeah. well, this this advanced quickly. Like, this is <laughs> this is some like, yeah. did he do nothing but just sit on the couch this whole time? And then was like, oh no, <laughs> this has gotten real bad. I need to go get that crystal that didn't exist before this movie. But now I'll do whatever I do with that. And it, it kind of se- it kind of seemed like he just got the like you said he, he just got the flu, and then you know there was a MythBusters marathon on or something, and he just you know he didn't feel like getting up. There, there was just uh, there was something else to do. I can't remember. Was there like any mention of kryptonite in the creation of no. uh, Nuclear Man? Because it doesn't really make sense. No. Because if he's if he's like powers are based on the sun, and he has this nuclear, then from what I'm scratching, <laughs> Superman should just make well. Superman from what stronger. I can tell, the components of Nuclear Man were uh, the the hair. This piece of fabric that John Cryer says, uh, that's not going to be enough to cover him. And he says something like, it's got a computer chip in it. It'll be fine. And I'm like, okay, whatever. It's weird that you're explaining that. And then he, like, shovels a little bit of dirt or something in there. And that's what makes him? I don't know. And why he has Gene Hackman's voice really makes you wonder what else was in there. Because it's, it's, that part doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Part of me like thought like oh maybe the actor was so bad but then it is an actual plot point it is something they address in the movie it's not it's not something that just happens where all of a sudden it's not like a when Andy McDowell having Glenn Close's voice in Greystoke <laughs> right <laughs> yeah I, I thought the same thing I was like oh he must have been bad but they immediately is like why do you have his voice and it's it's like oh they meant for this but they're not explaining why and they never do uh, which just means that. At one point, Gene Hackman had to go into a recording booth and go, Grah! Three or four times. <laughs> Where is she? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Was, was, the, was the big that's, line delivery for me. Yeah. Uh, but it's like questions like that that just spin you off in all sorts of different ways. Like, what did they cut? What was the explanation? Did they explain? Why would they care? There's just all these times that it's just like, well, that doesn't make sense. And there, the movie doesn't ever bother I, I the most egregious thing that's missing i think is that perry white leaves the daily planet to go get a loan and then i swear to god a month goes by in movie time and then he just shows back up like i did it it's like wait <laughs> you were gone that entire time this actually that it actually so. made me think uh, I, uh there's the kurt russell uh disney movies and he, as they went on, he was in them less and less to the point in the last one, the world's strongest man. Like he's in it for the first 15 minutes. 
then disappears for like literally an hour of the movie and then it's in the last 15 minutes <laughs> and it, it's sort of like a case where you know when jackie cooper is going like yeah no i'll give you like four days uh because although he was like uh he, he was uh directing uh uh, uh, also so maybe maybe he did have other time commitments or something but like i feel like when 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 that when when like a guy who is basically lucky to have an acting job at this point in his career <laughs> is going like no i'm good <laughs> like like yeah. i feel like i feel was, like mark was mcclure so was probably yeah. the only one who enthusiastically signed up for superman 4 everyone else had to be convinced and Mr. Warfield wanted me to get some shots here with lots of local color. Well, I can't think of anything too special. Hi, Jeremy. Superman. Jimmy? What a scoop! I mean, considering he's the only one in Supergirl, mm. you know, that dude will just be like, yeah. yes, Zemeckis, Zemeckis is busy right now. He's not calling. I got to yeah. go do this. <laughs> also, I find it weird that it took the fourth movie of shooting in England to get William Hookins into this thing. Yeah. Um, and also Jim Broadbent, what the hell? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can we talk about French Jim Broadbent? Because I'm looking at him and I'm like, <laughs> he's like one of the most British people in history. And you know, you're French. Do a French accent. I feel like the only, like, probably british actor who feels egregiously dubbed is the kid like i like there especially i i, I there was some point, it's one of those performances where i can't tell if his entire performance is dubbed or if there was just some bad adr or something but cause he is certainly moments. dubbed in his first scene because he's yeah. doing this new york accent that is yeah clearly not coming from that child because <laughs> even like i i will say like if if there is a fault in the donner like the, the donner superman is that some of the uh the the dubbing of the clearly british actors doing american accents is quite a lot more noticeable than any of the other effects in that movie well i think they continue that trend because like when they're yeah. talking to soldiers in the missiles missile silos and stuff they're all like well golly guy you know and it's like <laughs> yeah. you know that guy is not talking like that at all <laughs> yeah so I also don't understand that whole, you know, when Luther takes over the the missile silo thing. It seems so ridiculously convoluted, whatever it is they're doing. Yeah. And why they fire that missile directly back at them and then it goes up into space. It's like, that seems like a bad idea. <laughs> so, but my, my, my favorite Lex Luthor thing, I got to just mention this. The whole time I'm like... When's he going to rip the wig off? Because, like, that's the big Lex Luthor reveal in these things. He goes, ha ha, I'm bald. And it's like, oh, no. Um, but he doesn't do that. He just has his Gene Hackman hair the whole time. Which means that Lex Luthor is wearing a wig that barely has any hair on it. Yeah. And <laughs> and that is hilarious to me. <laughs> well, famously, like, that was always the complaint about them casting Hackman was that he refused to shave his head for the role so the the two like the two scenes in the in the in the other movies he's wearing a bald cap and like they basically shot it so it wasn't that obvious whereas in this case he's like yeah like the bald, bald cat sucks so yeah. i'm not even gonna go that far because like at this point like this with this movie like they could have given him a full bald cap and like it would have like looked no shittier than anything else in the movie so it would have been fine. <laughs> it would have fit right in. You would have been like, oh, look at you trying that. <laughs> that's, that's cute. <laughs> How do we feel Superman 4 compares to Superman 3? Because that is a movie that is much maligned. But I actually quite like Superman 3. Like, it's one of those ones where I tend to like it for all the reasons everybody else hates it. I'm a Superman 3 apologist. Um, some of that is just childhood nostalgia because yeah. I loved it as a kid. But I watched it again recently, and I'm like, there is some, there's some really stupid yeah. things in it, but there's some really solid Superman stuff happening in that. I still feel like, in terms of like special effects from that time, few things ever top, top Superman fighting himself in the junkyard. I, I feel like that is a genuinely great sequence. And it I, is the, it is the best scene in the movie. It is yeah. really 
crowd pumping. I think I think the way that scene ends is just like, yes, this yeah. is why I watch Superman movies. Absolutely, yeah. let's go, let's do this. Yeah. Uh, other things in it, not so much, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, everyone talks about like, oh, the robot lady scared me to death as a kid, and I thought I thought that was the coolest. Like this movie yeah. is dark, and that's great. Yeah. So. I, I give Superman three a pass. I think I wanted to I wanted to talk about talk about um, Sidney Fury for just a quick second before I moved on, and he's a. I mean, I I, I feel like with, what's his, is his middle initial? Yes, J. It, it should be Sidney J. Journeyman Fury, because yeah. <laughs> I feel like he is the prototype of the journeyman filmmaker. He is, and he's. I mean, he's he's won a BAFTA. He's nominated for the Palme d'Or. For um, yeah. Ipcris file, um, he's yeah. done uh, a number of movies that I quite like, and not ironically, uh, the entity is really well made. Um, mm-hmm. It's, I mean, it's low budget, harrowing filmmaking. I mean, what he did with that movie, I think, is impressive. I know that people don't like it, um, but I think that's really affecting. Uh, so, you know, watching what he did here. I mean, you can look at other stuff in this particular time period, like Iron Eagle, which is just a cheese fest, too. And you're working in this, like, ripping off uh, another more popular movie. Um, but even the, the filmmaking in Iron Eagle isn't bad. I mean, it's it's certainly passable. It does exactly what it needs to do. So the Journeyman label is accurate. And I just, like... At this point in his career, I don't see... It's not like you can say he fell off the table at any point. Like, he's, he's done solid work throughout. And then what's this? I don't blame him at all for this movie. And I think that's what I want to know is, like, where he at, where his influence ends. He, he was replacing someone who had just gotten fired. So he's, like, pretty much... Like, that, that cut into the time he had to, like, work on po- pre-production. And then just before he's about to start, they cut his budget in half. So, like, it's almost like it's a miracle that he made a Superman movie at all. So, I, I, it's terrible, and it looks like shit, but considering, like, what happened behind the scenes, it's kind of amazing that anything got made at all. You know, you can, the only thing you can really look at from him is performance. Like, is he getting the performance that fits whatever he had on the page? Like, if, if he's working from that original screenplay... And I, I mean, I don't know when scenes were cut, like how much they filmed, you know, the extent of how it was gutted during production. And you know, he's what he's getting from the actors is is good. I mean, they're all good. Um, some of them fare better because of the material, but I'm not sure you can ask more from them. And in that respect, I think he did, you know, he he, he did exactly what was what was needed from him. And there's just only so much you can repair. Well, and also he's he's operating under the handicap of being a filmmaker who doesn't really have a distinctive style. Yeah, making a uh, like the fourth movie after two filmmakers who have very distinctive styles. Like you know, he has to not only do Richard Donner, he has to do Richard Lester. Which I mean, I'm sorry, there's only one Richard Lester. And even then, Richard Lester was only Richard Lester half the time. Like, so that 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 degree of difficulty he was working with. Like, I've I have total sympathy for him. Like, I am not going to go, oh fuck that guy for directing this shitty movie. It's sort of like I'm kind of amazed that he got anything filmed at all. Yeah, and you look at what what goes wrong, and it's not, you know, the responsibility doesn't fall with the director for the things that go terribly awry and you can point to maybe the the screwball scene in the apartment as something that shouldn't have happened perhaps the way that it did it was just misconceived yeah Yeah. but it it was flawed from the page but also there are elements of that in the other movies it's one of the things where i can understand why it was in the screenplay but once they started cutting shit and were like okay I, I guess probably the main reason was because it didn't really involve any uh, optical effects. 
so we can like just put it in there and we don't have to pay any extra money whereas the other scenes they cut they probably because of the test screening that they were in they probably didn't have finished effects so like well if we cut that stuff then we don't have to pay for the special effects for that stuff so we'll leave this other stuff in that you know something had to stay to get really should be in there yeah 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 (laughs) we're still a young planet there are galaxies out there other civilizations for us to meet to learn from what a brilliant future we could have well speaking of we'll get to my first trivia question which is about sydney j fury beyond superman 4 canadian director sydney j fury is probably best known for his work on the iron eagle franchise how many iron eagle movies were made and how many did fury direct it's unfair that I know this, so I will. <laughs> no, no, oh. you, no, a hundred percent. If you know it, that's because a lot of these, I, I thought these are good Chuck questions. Well, Chuck can prove his, uh, his, his there, mastery. There are four Iron Eagle movies. I want to say yeah. th- he directed three of them. He did. I think he did yeah. all. He did three. three. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, the only one he didn't direct was Iron a- uh, Aces, Iron Eagle Three, which was helmed by Octopussies. John Glenn. Yeah. It's a rare a rare non-Bond movie for Glenn is uh is is uh Ace's Iron Eagle 3 which I own the poster for and the Blu-ray and I don't think I've gotten through uh a third of it. Oh, you should watch it. <laughs> Despite the fact that uh, uh, Rachel McLeish is the only reason for me to 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 watch it because she's a very attractive woman. Uh I, I have trace memories of John Glenn directing a Christopher Columbus movie too. Is that yes, the... yeah, I think he did the the, Sol- the one produced by the Salkinds. Yeah, yeah, the because there was the competing. There was fourteen ninety two, which was the uh, Ridley Scott one, and Christopher Columbus Discovery, which was the, the one John with Tom Glenn Selleck one. In it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> While making Superman four, Cannon was in talks with Albert Pion about directing Superman five which obviously never happened. Instead, he made this film using the sets created for the unmade sequel to Masters of the Universe. For a bonus point, identify the Chris Christopherson film that was supposed to be the sequel to that film before Canon went bankrupt and it ended up being filmed and released as an unrelated movie. Well, he made Cyborg. I was going to yeah. say Cyborg. Yeah. So what was, what's the, what's, because Cyborg ended up having a sequel, but Pune actually made what would have been his sequel to Cyborg, but it was released as an unrelated movie. Is it Knights? <laughs> it's Knights. Yeah. I hate myself. <laughs> I, I, I deliberately crafted okay. this to like basically show how much of a nerd well. you really are and how much how this this is why when i said when you suggested this <laughs> it's entrapment. When, when you suggested superman 4 my shock wasn't that you suggested superman 4 my shock was that you hadn't seen it <laughs> we have cured that problem <laughs> after moving to after moving to london american actor william hookins booked sometimes memorable supporting roles in five different iconic film franchises what were they batman yeah. Um, Raiders. Yep. 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 Star Wars. Superman 4. <laughs> Superman. And the fifth one you're not going to get because it was basically a cameo role and he was in Trail of the Pink Panther and Curse That's of the right. Pink Panther. I've seen those movies way too many okay. times. <laughs> <laughs> Which, like, I, 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 have, I don't think I've ever finished uh, Trail. So I'm assuming, I, I'm guessing it's probably the same scene just used twice. Because I know that Trail was basically just a patchwork movie, and Curse like had a bunch of bit, bit of password patchwork in it with Ted Wass too. No, they 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 have different endings. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, one sets up the next one, and it's not they don't regurgitate that. Okay, so question number four: Despite his working since the seventies, this Oscar-winning icon who is not in Superman four found his stagnating career revitalized thanks to a film that would not have existed if it wasn't for Superman 4. Who is this icon? That question is a journey. Uh, (laughs) He's not in Superman 4, but his career was revitalized because of Superman 4. Yeah. Think back to my Bruce Almighty uh, reference. 
Oh, is this a Street Smart thing? It is. Okay, so we're Morgan Freeman. It's Morgan Freeman. Yeah. Okay. Like part of part of uh, Christopher Reeve's deal to make Superman four was he would do it for I think it was eight million dollars, and Cannon would have to make Street Smart. Uh, which was his passion project at the time. And Morgan Friedman was cast as the bad guy in Street Smart. And that was the role that got him noticed and made him sort of led to other things. Like he basically wouldn't have gotten Driving Miss Daisy if it wasn't for him having gotten the acclaim for having been in Street Smart. Yeah, I was going to say the best thing about Superman 4 is that Street Smart got made because of it. And, and <laughs> yeah, Morgan yeah. Freeman is amazing in that movie. That movie... It's a difficult yeah. watch, but it is it is an incredible acting movie. If you're a fan of performances, that is a movie. So, like I, I've I've always said, if it wasn't for Runaway Train, Street Smart would probably be the best film that Canon ever made. Not Superman Four. Fuck you, John Luke. <laughs> <laughs> Hey man, you said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I've never watched King Lear. I, I I hate Godard, so I like him. What Godard making a canon movie would not make me happy. Uh, in Mark, <laughs> in Mark McClure's segment in the sketch anthology film Amazon Women on the Moon, on the next episode of he Cinema Shame, on screen renting a movie from this legendary exploitation film pioneer. If you remember the sequence, it actually makes a lot of sense that they cast this guy as the guy who rents him the video. I remember his half of the scene. I don't remember who he rents it from. Think of Corinne Alphin's uh, enormous breasts. That's a clue. I mean, is it Russ Meyer? (laughs) It's Russ Meyer. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I don't think I knew that. (laughs) Which of the following six filmmakers was never involved in the making of a Superman movie. Tim Burton, Mick G, Wolfgang Peterson, George Miller, Guy Hamilton, Joe Dante. If I had to guess that one, I would say Dante. Do you have a guess, James? <sighs> my, I, Dante was my guess too, but... Tim Burton was set to direct Superman Lives. Mick G was set to direct Superman Flyby. Wolf Peter Wolfgang Peterson was set to direct a version of Batman vs Superman over a decade before the the Snyder one was made. George Miller was set to direct Justice League Mortal. Uh, Guy Hamilton worked on Superman before he was replaced by Richard Donner, and Joe Dante hasn't been attached to anything Superman related, but did work on a pre-Burton Batman movie where he planned on casting Bill Murray as Bruce Wayne and John Lithgow as the Joker. Well, okay. (laughs) Honestly, I I would like to live in a universe where all those movies got made. (laughs) Except maybe the Guy Hamilton Superman. I feel like that would have been... Quite, quite terrible. <laughs> Never have I thought a movie would have been improved by Guy Hamilton's involvement. Christopher Reeve followed his run of unnecessary sequels in 1988 when he starred in this TV movie sequel to one of the greatest World War II movies of all time. Uh, the Great Escape 2. The Untold Story. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> he had a sweet little mustache in that. <laughs> Because you know everyone did in World War Two. <laughs> I think I think we're we're, we're edging close to uh, to uh, <laughs> you having the best run on trivia we've ever had. Uh, I feel like this one might be the one uh, you don't get, but uh, that that and maybe sure. the last one because it's 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 more of a James question than a, an Alan question. Meaning there is no answer. <laughs> well, there is an answer, but there's no earthly reason why you would actually know it. Uh, The same year he appeared in Superman, the first movie, Jackie Coogan directed a TV movie biopic about this legendary movie star slash singer. I don't have any idea. Any any guesses, James? None. None? Judy Garland. It was a movie called Rainbow. Oh, shit. That's right. I I, I completely forgot about it, but then when I was researching, like... Stuff for the trivia. I saw the poster. It's like, oh, I saw that video cover. I definitely saw that video cover. Yeah. In Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Sound of Music co-star Nicholas Hammond appears as Superman 4 co-star Sam Wanamaker, 
who directed the actual episode of Lancer that Tarantino borrowed for his film. What famous superhero did Hammond play in the 1970s? He played the Amazing Spider-Man. In the, uh... What? <laughs> yeah. In the TV show. <laughs> Oh, that's right. There was that thing. Okay. Yeah. I was desperately trying to think of any any TV okay. show, and I danced all the way around that. I, I didn't come up with it, but yeah, that, <laughs> that's good. Because uh-huh. it's funny, because like, re- literally like the only two things Nicholas Hammond is famous for is The Sound of Music and for being Spider-Man. <laughs> and, and it's clear how much Spider-Man has faded from public memory that people forget that. Because they mm-hmm. were really terrible, like uh, legitimately. It was a classic case of like, we have no budget to do this, so we're going to... And also all of the... like I don't think there's a single Spider-Man villain in any of the Spider-Man episodes. It's all just random like mobsters and uh, hench people. Well, that sounds great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is the last question, and like I said, there's no reasonable way you should actually know this, but still, I feel like if you think about it just based on context you should be able to figure it out. Who is the only person in Superman 4, A Quest for Peace, who briefly dated my cousin Joanne's husband, Jock? John Cryer. (laughs) Incorrect. (laughs) Uh, Well, I mean, is it Mario Hemingway? No, it was Margot Kidder. Oh, well, I was going to say, it was a 50-50 shot. I think there's only two women in that entire film. which, which, Which of the two is Canadian? <laughs> I, that's come on. <laughs> we don't. Yeah, I, I, and I only found out about this when I like when she died, and I posted a little tribute thing on Facebook. And Joe, I was like, oh yeah, Jock knew her and, and dated her briefly in the sixties. And 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 in other in other cases, like you might go bullshit, but like knowing Jock, it was like, oh yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> I was gonna guess the school teacher, but. <laughs> That's what I thought it was the twist was John Cryer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was the 60s, but John Cryer wouldn't have been alive at that point. So I guess that's true. <laughs> Do we have a date? I didn't I didn't think I had a date for the for the actual <laughs> dating. I thought we just had Well, uh, I, I think we we've said everything that needs to be said about Superman for a quest for peace. I'm really uh, happy that, that Chuck was able to join us and uh, do as well as he did on trivia, because like I said, most, most of the times these, I'm just doing these to, to, you know, prove how smart I am by knowing a little <laughs> stupid factoid and, uh, and, and, and twisting it. So the fact that you, I think you got eight out of 10, which is pretty, pretty damn good. Uh, uh, I think that's the record. Uh, from now on, we'll we'll call we'll, we'll base it on the Chuck test. If if anyone can beat the the, the Chuck uh, test, oh, because let's not call it that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll we'll call it Chuck Fine. Is it? it are, are, have they reached a level of Chuck Fine? Which is if you if you've ever listened to Bavcast, you know that's a that's a call out and tribute to to their show and all of the the many times they talk, said a movie that was, you know, terrible, but that meant it was Chuck Fine because Chuck Yeah, cuz you can like watch it. it. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a valid response. <laughs> uh thanks thanks again for for joining us and is there anything you want to plug? I think I plugged the the two the two things that people can find you on, but is there anything else you're working on right now that no, I'm blissfully retired and just hanging out and just if a creative idea pops in my head, I'll do it. But I'm probably just going to guest on a podcast every two years or so. And then... <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll be happy to have you back. I mean, if you can think of uh, something that's also Chuck Fine that we can torture James with and make make him watch something that he really uh, is going to ha- be, be texting me while he's watching it, talking about how much he hates it. <laughs> I, I, it was only one message. <laughs> No, there were multiple messages because... Oh, well, you prompted it. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't as bad as Tiptoes. Tiptoes is our ultimate James oh, texting no, that... me going, what the fuck am I watching? <laughs> <laughs> so, well. well, that's a good question for James. Like, is this... Is Superman worse than Tiptoes in the worst movie we've watched for uh, for Cinema Shame? Uh, 
Tiptoes is think. worse. Yeah. yeah Tiptoes okay. is worse. Yeah. This is innocently dumb and terrible. Yeah. Tiptoes was an assault on my senses. And there were <laughs> extenuating cir- circumstances, whereas, like, Tiptoes is also a movie that was severely edited down from a much longer movie, but I cannot imagine any instance where that longer movie would have worked. <laughs> no, because the story that got cut was also terrible. Our theme song was written and recorded by Preacher Boy. Hear more from the godfather of alt blues at preacherboy.com. You can find us on Twitter at CinemaShame and on Instagram at CinemaShame Podcast. CinemaShame lives on the web at cinemashame.wordpress.com. If you have a confession you'd like to make on CinemaShame, email us at cinemashame at gmail.com or send us a message on Twitter. That's all for today's episode. You have chosen wisely.